Okay, my name is Mars Lautmann. I will give the presentation about uh, what has happened uh, to build open source firmware for uh, IoT devices, uh, which Bluetooth BLE. Um, so a little bit on me, for the few people that don't know me. I've been working on Bluetooth since 2000, so I've been doing this way too long. Um, I maintain the Bluesy Linux stack since uh, 2004, also quite a while now. Um, while I joined Intel in 2007, at the Open Source Technology Center, I created Conman, which is a connection manager, Ophono, which is a full telephony stack, Packrunner, which handles your proxy support, um, which finally gets all the JavaScript stuff that you need for this one sorted into a nice place. L, which I mentioned yesterday in my uh, wireless talk, our embedded Linux library that allows us to shrink things down, and also IWD, which is our new wireless daemon. So if you don't have seen the talk yesterday, go ahead and watch this. Uh, I think the uh, Linux Foundation uh, recorded most of these ones and will be on at some point. I sit on the Bluetooth Architecture Review Board uh, since a year now and do uh, mainly work on the specs on this one. I chair the Internet Working Group in the Bluetooth SIG and I also work on Bluetooth Mesh. While I will be not be talking about Mesh, if you want to talk about this, uh, find me uh, in the hallway uh, during the conference. So today I'm doing a little bit of history in Bluetooth, so just get you up to speed and see where the road we've traveled so far on this one and that you actually learned how to appreciate what has happened and what's going to changing uh, really soon and in the future. Um, I show you how low energy has evolved and how low energy works today and what we are really driving toward this one because low energy will be one of the technologies making a huge difference uh, in Bluetooth these days. And then how this has changed to actually give the control to the people that actually want to build something. Because previously a lot of these things were, uh, the manufacturers were in charge and were telling you what to do and things actually changing and uh, changing rapidly right now. And then what's coming next because we have a bunch of new technologies coming out that uh, will be interesting and we want to give people early access to play with this one as soon as we have standardized them and be able to talk about this in public. So a little bit about the history. Bluetooth is 1.0b, 1.0 a was a disaster spec, 1.0b was the first one you could actually use, 99. So that's a pretty old spec by now. Um, I still have devices that support 1.0b, hard to find by, I think there are two or three in the world that still exist. Uh, they still work with Linux, so it's kind of cool if you take them out in a while every now and then and try them to work with them. Um, but I don't recommend doing this one because first of all you need a PCMSA card slot, which is hard to find these days. Um, most prominent spec is 2.1. Uh, from 2007, so uh, pretty much a nine-year-old spec. Um, it's prominent because the car manufacturers move at a slow pace and that's still used in some of the cars out there and will be still be used for the next three or four years before they've moved on to something else. Um, with Classic, the latest spec that actually got an update for Classic is 4.1, where we added AS support for the encryption into the controller uh, from 2013. Uh, previously, Bluetooth was using E0 Cypher. Um, finally, they went into, we need FIPS compliance, and so AS went into this one. Uh, a long time later after the first release. There's an interim version with, or an interim feature with high speed, version 3.0 from 2009. It kind of died down since considering using Wi-Fi or ultra wideband as the high speed transport was a nice idea, but it never took off. Um, so there was one spec released with this one, major feature, never went anywhere, and that's why 2.1 got stuck there as the one big one they wanted to support. There will be devices that declare themselves at 3.0 compliant. Uh, they are compliant, but you will not find a high-speed feature in these ones because you need a Wi-Fi controller supporting this one. Um, Linux actually does support high-speed, but I haven't really seen this used by anybody. It's one of these features we, we mentioned. We got into the Linux kernel uh, at some point, and then uh, it got never used by anybody. Um, the interesting part, and this is the main focus of the talk, we started with 4.0 uh, with low energy support in 2010. So we're right now six years in a cycle of uh, 4.0 being released. And my standard rule of thumb is, if you have wireless technologies from the day the spec gets released publicly to mass adoption is for around four to five years. So as you see, 4.0 came out really um, uh, seven, uh, sorry, six years ago and about a year or two years ago, finding low energy is everywhere. You find it in every phone, you find it every phone supported. You can buy devices for really cheap in the market. You can go to Amazon, eBay, God knows who, and then you just buy a, a, thermo a thermometer or any kind of sensor, and uh, chips are cheap. They cost a couple of bucks. So version 4.1 uh, was the interesting one. While it added AS support for uh, a classic, um, it removed the topology limitations on uh, uh, 4.0, and I will get to that one in a later slide and say where you had the topology limitations. But to drive low energy further, we needed to remove these ones where we had limitations on who can talk to who. Uh, the interesting spec really recently released is 4.2, which finally moved uh, the security handling of uh, low energy into a, 
uh, FIPS compliance with um, AS, uh, sorry, 4.0 always had AS support, so the encryption was always done with AS, uh, but the pairing and the key exchange was fundamentally broken. It took you less than a second to break the keys. Um, once you're actually able to sniff the communication. Um, 4.0 introduced elliptic curves, uh, ECDH, P256 curves, so it's pretty much uh, strong crypto and will make sure that your keys never going to leak. So 2014, if you go with my rule, we're still about a year in before 4.2 will be seen in mass market devices. And what we have in reality right now, everything supports 4.0, but you will not find anything with supporting 4.1. Or if you have a 4.1 ship, you will not find a host that supports it. On Linux, we have actually done this. Uh, it has fully 4.2 support, but if you don't have 4.2 hardware, we don't get any far. Um, what's coming next for the technology, and this is a copy from the Bluetooth SIG uh, press announcement, since I'm actually officially not allowed to talk to this in, about this in public. Uh, we're gonna have longer range, so they're talking about we're actually gonna extend the range of Bluetooth uh, from uh, your average 10 meters into a, a stadium size ranges. Uh, we get faster speed uh, and we also get mesh topologies uh, supported in 2016. Um, so there will be two things. The Bluetooth mesh will be coming. That adds mesh topology and we will have Bluetooth 5. They changed the versioning and the branding a little bit announced this. Um, quadruple range, doubles of speed and the broadcasting capabilities for beacons, they say 800%. Take these numbers with a grain of salt. They're a little bit made up numbers. Uh, the technical ones are a little bit different, uh, but we increasing the technology a lot with Bluetooth 5 coming out uh, this year. So back to the, what I mentioned earlier, the ecosystem, when 4.0 got released, they had the fundamental idea that devices that support classic and low energy are your main hubs in your system. So that's your desktop computer, your laptop, your phone, and so on and so forth. And on the right side, you have the new low energy devices uh, like sensors, keys, keyboards, and so on and so forth, which is super neat. And they can just talk to these devices and your phone is collecting the data, the desktop is collecting data, and so on and so forth. And then you had the legacy ones that you had, your cars, your headsets, and everything else that was actually using Bluetooth Classic and they can talk to this one. But this also means the right side could never talk to the left side because the over the air protocol was completely incompatible. Um, and they wanted it this way with a 4.0 and the topology notations because I always wanted to have the hub in between. So even low energy devices couldn't talk to themselves pretty much. Um, that is what 4.1 changed because they moved the focus onto uh, low energy and we only do low energy. So 4.2 never had any updates for a classic and 5 will have, I think, only single or two features that extend in classic a little bit. But you see where the trend is going with this one. Uh, I think classic is at its end of the evolution of new features and all the new features are going into low energy as a technology. So that's where you're focusing on. But while we're on the history, um, uh, to appreciate what actually has changed and how this has changed, this is the early stack diagrams that you can find on how Bluetooth 1.0b looked like. It looks really complex. You have the, the most important part, you have the split in the middle, which is called host control interface, which separates the hardware from the, uh, from the host operating system. Um, and then you have an audio that always was special, but you always had the legacy stuff. Uh, we have to emulate PPP, we have to emulate AT commands, and on so forth and so forth. Some of these things got deprecated over time, but some of the stuff is still there. So the serial port emulation is still existing and hard to get out. Headsets still use AT commands to actually trigger um, uh, call state changes and so on and so forth. Uh, some protocols like TCB has been, which was uh, way superior, got uh, uh, deprecated at some point. It's a binary audio control protocol, mainly coming from the DECT world, um, died uh, a couple of years back. Um, there was an attempt, which is kind of interesting, to try actually build a Java API, but they weren't really successful in this one. Uh, Oracle still uh, supports it on the website and says we're still supporting this one. Uh, it never succeeded in anything, but it was trying to grab the whole stack and build an API on top of it. And it's one of the things where trying to unify the API and provide an API for Bluetooth Classic completely failed. I think no, no operating system has a really good API. Either feature supported by the operating system or you can't use it. And that was the biggest problem with Bluetooth Classic that unless there's a profile and the operating system supports it, you're not going to use it which then also fell back into the car industry, which they were really slowly adopting these new profiles and so your car might support or might not support it. Um, to scare you off a little bit, that's the Windows side of the Bluetooth stack these days. Um, that supports Classic and BLE and the interesting part is really pretty much everything on the right side is uh, Classic. The part is where they actually do low energy. Actually, can anybody find this by any chance just for the sake of it? The teeny tiny onesie over here that's pretty much your low energy support and they have a little bit in hardware and then have a little bit APIs on the top. Everything on the right side is to actually make classic work and integrate with the operating system. And then BLE is this thing. 
Um, it's not as bad as in Linux, um, but Linux has a lot of extra support for classic as well, where you need a lot of overhead. And the percentage that it goes, like you, want, you end up with 20% of the stack if you just would support LE only. It's just to scare you off a little bit. The controller side doesn't look much better. If you actually have a controller that has a dual mode uh, support for classic and LE, you have this little bit LE side that integrates with this one, and then you have legacy old uh, big uh, handling how the controller does it. And you have the device manager in there, which in uh, uh, LE went up into the host stack. It's like, we're not gonna do this anymore. We're treating the hardware to actually get us on the air and uh, we're doing the most of the other stuff uh, inside uh, uh, the host. This also implies the security, which in Classic was inside the controller, so you had nothing to do there. It would do all the pairing for you, just tell it to do it, uh, while LE it actually went into the host and said, look, the only thing the controller has to do is the encryption because we want to offload this one as much as possible or everything else around uh, pairing and uh, keys we actually do in the host, which also means it's easier to update. So after scaring you a little bit on this one, um, getting this one into a little bit more controlled shape and the ones we actually want to talk about is how does a LE only stack actually looks like. So you have the hardware side and it doesn't really change much. You have your host controller interface, which HDI was Bluetooth, uh, has actually done absolutely right since the beginning that this unified hardware interface would makes it really easy to integrate no matter what transport you're operating on compared to Wi-Fi where you actually have to play uh, a lot of uh, tricks to get vendors supported and there's still hardware that isn't supported on Linux, which is kind of bad. You have your link layer, which is pretty much your schedule on how to put the packets on the air and do a lot of extra handling for the exchange, how to set things up. You have a test mode and you have your physical layer and that's basically pretty much your radio IF at that point. And that's about it. That's all what your controller is doing. So 4.0 controllers for LE only are really, really, really simple. The host side has to do a little bit more. We kept around the L2CAP link, uh, logical link control and adaptation protocol. It pretty much gives you multiplexing for channels and we 4.1 extended this one into actually uh, connection oriented channels. So you have data streams there as well. But then at the end point, there's just an attribute protocol and we'll get into this one, how that works a little bit later. And you have a security manager. As I said earlier, the security manager were, was moved out of the controller into the host so you can easily adopt this. Which meant also for us, you can run uh, support for elliptic curves on a really old controller because nothing has to change there. The only thing the controller does is AES encryption. Um, then you put this together, the attribute profile and the access profile, and then pretty much that, and you have your applications. So all the complicated profile things are moved out, and the logic on what to do is moved into the applications, um, which makes it a lot simpler and a lot more useful if you want to actually do any kind of uh, um, sensor devices and then talk to them from the phone. Everything becomes an application pretty much. Um, so, a little bit of background. The roles we have with low energy, we have a central, that's normally your desktop, phone, etc. It's the master device, um, and you can't actually switch roles. Classic allowed to switch roles between master and slaves. That has been gone away with low energy because there was always a pain point. Like, look, one, point, one device is the master and it sticks with it forever. So the central is the master device. You use this normally for accessing information, so you want to take your own phone, grab your temperature from your sensor, and that's about it. That's the master device. The peripheral is the slave device. That is your um, uh, uh, sensor device which actually provides the data. So just, oh, I have, a sen I have a temperature. I can tell it to you if you want to. And then you have the other ro uh, roles, observer and broadcaster, which are not widely known because mainly nobody talks about them. They are the scanner, uh, so you want to find beacons if you're an observer. It's like if you want to scan for eye beacons, eddy stone, or something like that. And you have the broadcaster, which would be the beacon itself. Uh, fundamentally, observer uh, is a subpart of the central, and the broadcaster is subpart of the peripheral, because you actually need to implement observer if you want to be a central, and you need to implement a broadcaster if you want to be a peripheral. This also means if you want to build a really cheap and dirty broadcaster device that's just a beacon, you only need half of the link layer because you don't have to do any connections, you just broadcast information, which makes it even easier to do this to build these kind of devices. And this will become more important when we go into apologies like Mesh, where uh, you can run with observer and broadcaster only roles for certain uh, devices inside the Mesh, which means, oh, I can actually remove certain functionality and make the devices even cheaper. And the topology diagram you see on the right is where this uh, fundamentally goes. You have the master being your central of the devices, so you actually uh, know what it's doing, but it can also talk to the other devices. Um, but a peripheral will never talk to peripheral. That's not possible. But what is possible, you can actually support peripheral and central mode at the same time with 4.1 because the limitations have been removed. So if you want to be a peripheral and a central at the same time, you can do this. But you have to be both if you want to talk uh, in both directions. Um, when coming to get, um, this is pretty much a database. And that's all it is. It's key value pairs on your device. And uh, it puts a little bit of semantics around this, but at the base of it, you have a key, which is a handle, 16-bit um, uh, handle, 
and then you get a value. So you ask the database, what is the value for this handle, and then you get the information. Some of the handles are characteristics that give you extra information about what the service provides. Other ones give you information about the service. So you can then have magic UIDs that allows you to find things. But at the end of the day, it's just a key value pair uh, on the database, which makes it really easy for the peripheral to implement because they just implement the database. If it's a static one, for example, uh, you just implement the database and you hand out the information. And on the client side, which would be the central uh, or the master device, you just have the use case. You go like, I need the temperature value, and then you have a list of uh, key value pairs you have to ask for to find your key value that actually represents their temperature, and then you go for this one. So it goes from the client to the master, asking the database, going through them. So you discover the services, you discover the characteristics, and then you get your values. Um, it's a simplified view on this one. Um, if you actually read the literature, it gets more complicated. But at the end of the day, that's about it, what you have to do, which means also the over -air protocol is simple and uh, stays simple. Um, so now to the open source part, um, after the little bit introduction into what we have with Low Energy. So the Linux Bluetooth stack, Bluesy, has been around for a long time. It's a dual mode stack, supports classic uh, and uh, low energy. It also supports high speed, as I mentioned, but it's pretty much unused. But it's a stack that it's, sits above HCI, so it never deals with the hardware directly. It always relies on that uh, the hardware provides an HCI interface for the separation. Um, it's integrated into Linux kernel, so it has been there since 2.46. If anybody remembers that kernel, it's pretty wild. Um, and it provides standard application and socket APIs. So you have a uh, programming interface for control and you have socket APIs for all the layers that including L2CUP and RFCOM. So they behave like TCP and UDP. Kind of neat and easy to use, um, best API ever to be come up with. And there have been a lot of use cases. But at the end of the day, it was classic. It was always, um, we actually need to implement the profiles inside the user space in the daemon and give dedicated APIs to the uh, UI to use them, otherwise never going to be used. LE changed this a little bit with a gut API that we recently officially declared stable, and then you can actually just uh, use uh, uh, the gut API to uh, implement central and peripheral usages. Um, what we did recently when we announced Zephyr is that we announced it with a, a BLE stack. So Zephyr got a BLE only stack. Um, that sits above HCI implemented. So after Bluesy, we also started now implementing a, a second Bluetooth stack that is BLE only, dedicated for the Zephyr Atos. And uh, the Zephyr talks have been there, and you can see the stack in action at the demo booth uh, upstairs. It provides GUT APIs and also provides additionally the L2CUP APIs for connection audit channels. So if you're on a stream socket, you can do this as well. But if you just want to talk GUT, you can do this as well. Pretty simple, support central and peripheral roles. Uh, the website is there as well. Um, the only problem with Zephyr is that it requires you have HCI. While on the Linux side, that was a given, all the desktop cases, uh, or where Linux was running in phones, everything else, you have HCI as an interface. Nobody actually tried to invent something dedicated. If you look at the embedded space uh, and the maker devices, HCI was not the default interface. So HCI is defined, but it's defined as optional. Um, so that means that a lot of devices never used it. And the reason for this one was that Classic was not supposed to do this because the headphone case is a single mode chip where you actually want direct access to this one and getting, HCI would be getting in your way. At least that used to be the argument um, that nobody wanted to actually do this. And the headset manufacturers got away with this one because in Classic everything was profiles, everything was dedicated. Um, so they give you the whole solution. You put your XYZ uh, extra features on there, compile them, ship them as a device and you have a Bluetooth headset. Uh, worked well uh, Worked well for the companies to lock you in. Um, so if you get a CSR one, now Qualcomm, or if you get a Broadcom one, or if you get any other one's headset, and um, you basically locked into that manufacturer until you actually make the big switch to something else. Um, and they liked it this way. So the only problem is that lock-in actually extended to BLE, uh, which was really bad since BLE had this nice uh, easy and simple stack. You can really build it really small. You don't have to do any tricks. You don't have to do any shortcuts. Um, but for us, with Zephyr, this meant we actually couldn't get the Zephyr Bluetooth stack working against any hardware because we didn't have any HCI interfaces. The only thing that most of these had was GUT. So instead of just saying, oh, we have HCI, we're just exposing this one, and the uh, Artos has to implement the Bluetooth stack, they go, oh, all oh, these Artoses will never implement a Bluetooth stack. Uh, we just give you GUT, and then you have to talk GUT. The problem is every GUT API looks different. So if you want to change the uh, chipset manufacturer, you're doing all your work all over again, and some things might actually not work. Because they have dedicated use case, and a simple use case will always heart rate monitor, and that one works, and you want to do something more complicated, then you run into problems. So uh, when I gave this presentation for the first time, there was literally no device that I could find that actually has 
HCI support or that you actually could buy in the ELCD use. Um, so means our Zephyr Bluetooth stack couldn't really be used to actually make it work. And you're just locked into a closed system. If you keep doing this one, that's fine, but at some point you're gonna regret this that you actually are completely locked into the system. Um, it was even worse for dual chip solutions uh, where even the transport was completely different and really didn't help you. So they even changed the transport on an easier. So it wasn't a UART all the time. They might put the, some other transport and so on and so forth. Um, the biggest problem for us was, since we knew how the specs were developing with Bluetooth 5 and Bluetooth Mesh and IPv6 over BLE, we couldn't do it because IP6 or BLE doesn't run over GAT. It uses a connection-oriented channel over L to CAP. So it's like, how do you take these APIs that they're providing from the MCUs and actually run IP6 over it? It was impossible. So they were pretty much stuck with this one. It's like, look, this is not going to work. Um, and for the longest time, we were actually looking at what we can do different. Um, mainly since we had this nice device, the uh, nice Arduino 101 sitting on the desk, and look, well, that's actually a pretty neat device. So we have an uh, x86 quark, we have a 30 bit arc on this for sensors, and we have an NR51 Bluetooth controller from Nordic. And we support Zephyr on the arc core and the quark, um, but the NR51 was giving us a gut API. So what are we going to do with that one? So yes, it supports Bluetooth, but we couldn't really use it. So we could build uh, some API that emulated some of these GUT APIs, mapped this into the API of Zephyr Bluetooth stack, and could pretend to do something. Um, but at the end of the day, it really didn't give us anything to run with, because it was GUT only, it was pretty much boring. It was stuck with 4.0, so while Zephyr supported 4.1 and 4.2 features, including secure connections for really secure pairing, we couldn't use them. We were stuck with the Nordic soft device and the API built on top of this one. So no HCI access, okay, fine. We have to figure something out so we can run some emulation on this one. But no L2 cap channels, so IPSP not possible, no 4.1 features, no 4.2 features, secure connections out of the window, the privacy stuff where Bluetooth LE actually rotates your addresses every 15 minutes to avoid that you are trackable, not possible with this one since it didn't support it. The data length extensions that were available, we actually have higher, higher packets and get higher throughput. We couldn't use this, these either. The hardware would support it, but the software uh, just didn't expose this. So we are stuck with the uh, uh, 27 octets instead of 255 octets per MTU. Um, and then we look forward, uh, what do we do with Bluetooth 5 or mesh support? Uh, yeah, that's not gonna happen either on this one since we have no control on this one. Um, so what we really, really needed is to actually make sure that the Bluetooth controller doesn't run a closed source firmware. We really needed the controller also run an open source firmware. So we actually use the security manager from Zephyr to actually implement the, or we already had implemented the uh, newer security features, so we can just start using them. Um, and then we also can start use IPSP and do everything else. So full control from the hardware to the operating system, that's what we really were after, because otherwise we're gonna get stuck. And if you expect my five to uh, four to five years prediction of how things progress and how to get mass market adoption, if you wanna make this faster, you have to take things in your own hand, actually get something going. So we really needed an HCI firmware for uh, the Nordic chip, or we needed a different chip that actually proposes an HCI firmware. Um, as I said earlier, it's actually really hard to find. I think the world is changing a little bit, and you will find some people saying we have HCI firmware for early only chips, but when I looked around, um, there were rumors that Dialog has one, so they're announcing it. I couldn't get it, but maybe this has changed. And Cyprus had an extra firmware that you might be able to flush in there to actually give you an HCI uh, access. So I've not tried any of these ones. It's up to the uh, audience if you want to get try and please tell me back if this actually worked. Um, uh, we couldn't get any one of these or we couldn't actually get this tried or it was too complicated. Um, the alternative would be you stick a dual mode controller in there um, which actually support HCI which is uh, way more expensive, way, way, way more expensive. Uh, your power consumption will go up and uh, they optimize for BADR connections which is the biggest problem. If you buy a dual mode controller they prefer and will prioritize BADR connections and the schedule is designed this way. While an LE, LE only controller is designed for uh, LE operations and they are optimized for these ones. So we are basically stuck with between a rock and a hard place on this one. It's like, what are we gonna do? Um, luckily, um, there was a new project popping up at some point uh, called Minute. And they said, okay, we're actually gonna take an NR51 and NR52 chip and instead of just using the Nordic firmware, we start at the hardware level which is interesting since Nordic has the register sets for their um, uh, chip uh, open. So you can actually just download them and see what you can do on the uh, chip and how you program the IF side of this one. And they went through the whole uh, 
complication actually accessing the knowledge chip, porting their ATOS on this one, and then say, oh, look, we're going to write our own link manager because we actually don't want to deal with the complications that we're going to have a binary only link manager and um, have the problems that we actually have to can't fix this. And that was the main problem that they can't fix the link manager and they had heard complications for some use cases. Look, we want to use this XYZ, but it doesn't actually work and we can't get anybody in Nordic to uh, fix it or we are too small a company that somebody takes uh, a series of and so on and so forth. And we want new features like the data length extensions because we want to put a lot more data over the year, um, but they are not coming anytime soon. So they went through the effort in actually writing their own link layer uh, and then put this in. And they decided uh, the spec says HCI is the communication interface we should be using between the controller, so the hardware and, and the host. Why don't we just start using this one? And it was one of the first projects that actually proved that even if you use HCI internally, which was previously always declared as like overhead, it actually doesn't make a lot of difference. It actually helps you to uh, simplify the way how you're going to work because it's well-known interface, it's well understood, and it gives you a nice separation. Okay, this is a hardware problem, this is a, a host tech uh, problem. Um, there's an additional benefit, it actually helps you with qualification, since you can qualify one part of this one and qualify the other part, so your certification becomes overall a lot easier. If you only change one side, you don't have to redo the whole stack again. Um, so they had this running, but they were essentially all focusing on getting this running on the NR51 and 52, so even the BLE stack they were building was only running on this device. Um, as I said earlier, the Arduino actually has three cores. So it has a Lakemon core, an x86, it has the BLE chip from Nordic, and has a sensor core. We wanted to run um, the Bluetooth HCI firmware on the Bluetooth chip, on the Nordic chip, but we wanted to run the uh, Bluetooth host stack on the Quark. So what we did is we actually wrote a simple application, and it was really, really simple, a couple hundred lines of code. And lately I heard after the refactoring of Minute, this is actually only like 10 or 20 lines of code because it's become really simple to write this application. And it provides HCI back out of the UART. So the Arduino 101 has a UART in there, in the NR51, that is hooked up properly and uh, you can just then push the HCI data back out of this one. And then out of a sudden it started working with um, uh, our BLE stack and we had full access to this one. So this works on the Arduino 101, it works on the NF51 dongle, which is a neat dongle, it's a USB dongle. Previously, absolutely useless uh, unless you actually want to do some dedicated development on the NIF chip, but we can turn this now into a BLE-only dongle so you can attach this to your desktop PC and start uh, uh, testing new features. And since you have full control over the firmware, you can actually do whatever you want there. And the NIF52 dev boards are a little bit bigger, but they behave fundamentally the same thing. Um, we tested this against Stefa, but we also tested it against Bluesy, um, and we open sourced this and upstreamed this one into Minute, so Minute has support for this one default now. And they refactored it by now, as I said, the code for the BLE application turned into like really tiny now since they saw what we are doing with this one and they're even using this internally for testing now against Bluesy. If you want to use this on Bluesy, it's pretty much as simple as this. You attach the dongle, if you use an NR51 dongle, you attach the dongle to your PC and then you do a BAT attach uh, to attach the serial line uh, at a high speed and then it goes like, okay, fine, I'm doing this one and then you have your device and when and Bluesy starts taking this device, it just would be a normal USB dongle. Uh, works perfectly fine, also works with dev kits. Uh, I enjoy using the dongle, um, and you can just refresh this anytime you want to and uh, modify the firmware. Um, the same would work for all the external models, modules that you find on SparkFun and everything else, for the Raspberry Pi or the Mino board. Where, oh, you have to put this on the shield XYZ and then uh, attach this together. All these ones that on previously only exposed the gut APIs cannot be turned into HCI, and then if you run Linux on your Raspberry Pi, you can actually start using these one and have an integrated dongle on this one with Bluetooth LE that you actually start using something with it and don't have to deal with these APIs that uh, previously Nordic or some other manufacturer exposed. So with this one, looking at the Adreno 101 again, so finally we have x86 Quark Core that runs all our energy host deck, secure connection support, so we have 4.2 in there, we provide GUT and l 2 interfaces, and we can do IP6 via IPSP. So we got to the level where you actually have a full stack running on this one, on this hardware, and we can do whatever you want, want with it. Uh, and the guys uh, upstairs at the Zephyr demo booth actually showing this one on the Adreno 101 with a heart rate monitor running the full stack as full open source. So there's no uh, binary component or anything. Um, the Minute runs on the NF51 uh, MCU, and it provides the low engine firmware, and it provides the HCI UART application. Um, there's instructions, uh, I know the Zephyr went to 1.5, but this link is still working and the instructions are still the same. The instruction there on how to build the uh, firmware and flash it on the uh, Arduino 101 and hold, flash the Arduino 101 completely. Now we didn't stop at this one because once you actually have control of what your firmware is doing, you can actually do some neat things with this one where you actually provide 
advanced features that you will love as a developer, as, a, as, an, as anybody who wants to actually tamper with advice or someone that actually has to figure out what went wrong. So we went one step further and said, look, um, it's kind of nice that we have the Arduino 101, but actually if you want to debug this, if something went wrong, you have to do a lot of work. And since the number of UIs are kind of limited, you have to figure out, do I actually want to get traces of this one? Do I get a log message or what do I want? So Zephyr has a funny mode where you can enable a debug monitor. And the debug monitor means that we will combine the HCI traces that are talked between the two cores and actually spit them out over the debug line. But we can also combine any kind of log message into this one. So the special mode, you compile your application in, you can leave it on all the time, but it gets a little bit shady, uh, which allows you to actually take the HCI traces and the debug information and any kind of logging information and trace them back out. The interesting part is Bluesy has a tool called BTMon that has been supported uh, since a long time. It used to be called HCI dump, uh, but we made this more unified and more simpler. And then you can just connect that one now to a TTY, and the TTY would be your a TDY of your Arduino 101, and then you can just take the logs and it will decode them for you, and you can actually have an easy tool for running all these logs, and you get HCI traces and all logging information done. You can also store them, so you can't just read them and have to read them at high speed, you can just store them. Uh, we use the BT Snoop, it's a version of the Snoop file format for people who are still back from Solaris. It can store HCI packets, it can store logging information, it can store a lot of extra meta information. We, ex we keep extending this format. So b supports it for reading and writing, but also Wireshark supports it for reading and writing. So you can just take that, trace the, store that file and open in Wireshark if you want to look at this one later on. Uh, it's pretty nice if you uh, uh, want to do see what's going on with your hardware. Um, we did, or we always had this, but we never really announced this. But in case you actually don't have an Arduino 101 and trying to try this, you can run Zephyr and QAMO, which is kind of nice, but you don't have any hardware uh, to support it. So if you want to write a BLE uh, application, um, you might actually want to just use an existing dongle that you have on your host machine and just use this. And Bluesy always had the support for taking hardware, converting this into a serial port or Unix socket in this case, and then hand it over to QAMO. And inside QAMO it just shows up as a standard serial port and it will work, everything works as the same. So Zephyr has support for this one. On the Linux side, you just need a BT proxy, which proxies your uh, QAMO into an existing hardware. And then it creates a Unix socket with a, the minus U stands for Unix socket. You can also use TCP circuits or something else. Um, it creates a Unix socket and then uh, QAMO connects to this one. And inside QAMO, when you run Zephyr, it looks like a serial port and looks like a, any kind of hardware you're gonna have. There's instructions on also how to build your first Zephyr application running BLE. Uh, pretty simple, pretty straightforward if you want a beacon and if you just can run this in QAMO if you don't have any hardware. Uh, to test this out and then use your USB dongle that or UART dongle or whatever dongle you have on your host machine to uh, connect to this one. Uh, pretty easy to do. So with the interesting things now with Minute providing an open source link layer, out of a sudden the world actually changed quite a bit. So the first company or the first community that actually starts building a uh, link layer as open source and saying, look, we're giving this away under permissive license. Uh, go take it, uh, mess with it. We actually have, we actually think it makes a lot more sense. The world actually changed really rapidly. And about, I would say a month or two months ago, we actually had finally the second open source link layer implementation. So Nordic, uh, what they labeled their Phoenix link layer, they merged this into Zephyr. It's merged upstream into Zephyr, so you have this available. So there's a new link layer natively to Zephyr that you actually can use and it will support Bluetooth 4.2 uh, right now, but we're also working on extending this one for new features. It provides HCI, so it integrates natively with HCI and uh, with um, the uh, Zephyr HCI, which means you can actually have this working nicely on the NF51. And we hope that at some point in the really near future, I expect like a week or two or something, where we can replace the My New stack on the Arduino 101 with Zephyr, and we're just running Zephyr on all three cores um, with providing fully open source um, software for the whole hardware. Um, work is ongoing towards a more radio abstraction, so we actually want to include not the, just the Nordic chip, we want to include other chips as well from other manufacturers so we can just have fully open source uh, link layer and no matter where you're gonna walk with this one. And that's the whole vision for Zephyr that we actually have Bluetooth fully open source all the way through. Um, there are a few other things. Zephyr will get a, a classic support as well. Uh, don't expect an open source classic uh, uh, baseband. I don't think that's happening anytime soon. Um, but there will be an open source uh, classic stack for Zephyr so you don't have to go out and buy one or trying to find one. So this is work in progress with main target uh, for headset and headphones. Uh, you should watch for out for this one. I think parts of this one have already merged by now and we will start extending this one. So we're putting a couple of extra 
uh, features in there. Obviously optional, because the main focus is BLE for Zephyr, since that's the technology of the future. But we will get uh, dual mode support for this one as well. There's even more debugging and tracing work ongoing, because we want to even get more information out of the hardware when you actually need to debug something. Um, HCI is great, and HCI helps you a lot, but sometimes you actually need the link messages that go over the air. So we're going to take the link traces also out of the hardware and actually uh, we'll provide them uh, with a standardized interface. So this will be done for Minute and also therefore link layer stack, trying to get these ones out. So we, if something goes wrong, you actually can debug it because you can switch on the mode where the link messages will be forwarded to you and BTMON will just decode them. BTMON can already do this for uh, uh, existing dual mode hardware like from Broadcom or from Intel, where you actually have these traces available if you enable them. But we actually want to make sure that we have these ones as well. So you don't need to buy a $30,000 sniffer. Uh, if you have a teeny tiny problem, you can just tell them, okay, just tell me what you sent the other side and what the other side responded, and don't try to hide things from me, which is great. And you can only do this if you have really open source because you don't need to rely on a vendor to provide you these informations. And we will be extending the BT Snoop format even further with these ones. Um, the really next step is to actually get the open source firmware certified. And we were trying to actually do a qualification for this one and see uh, how far we're getting. It looks pretty good right now. There's no deadline set for this one, but we will actually provide a certification for this Bluetooth firmware at some point. As I mentioned earlier, Bluetooth 5 is around the corner. The Bluetooth SIG already announced that it's coming this year. Um, there's only a few months left for this year, and I think you can predict which months this will be released into based on some historic data. Um, Bluetooth 5 is coming. We heavily want to end, uh, add Bluetooth 5 to the Zephyr link layer. Uh, there's some nice features that are coming there that will make a huge difference. And then Bluetooth Mesh is also coming. We're also trying to get Bluetooth Mesh into Zephyr, so we actually have that one out of the box as open source available for everybody to with. And the main reason is that the, my four to five years prediction it takes to get mass market adoption, we can actually shrink this a little bit with the help of the community and open source and actually get, let's look, maybe we can do this in two or three years and get a mass market adoption for these technologies. They're not come overnight, but you have to give everybody a starting point and we will be trying to be as open as possible to get these features uh, available as soon as the specifications have been made public. Obviously, if the specifications have been made public, we can't really talk about this since they are confidential to the Bluetooth SIG. Um, and with that one, I'm happy to open this for questions. Yes, please. Uh, you mentioned briefly about certifications. So what do you mean to certify this if you want to rely on the knowledge chip, knowledge chip or Okay, so the question, I'll just repeat the question. So my quotes. The question was, uh, what are we actually going to certify uh, if the stack is on the running on the knowledge chip? So the Bluetooth SIG has the certification program set up like the way that you can separate the controller from the host stack. So you certify the host stack, which is the first target. So our host, existing host stack, we want to certify this. And then everybody can use this, no matter hardware, what you're going to choose, because it's hardware independent as soon as you use HCI. So when you actually want to certify the controller, it's hardware dependent. So we can run the test case on one and then assume they're going to apply to the same one. But fundamentally, you have to do this for Nordic ones, you have to do this for an Intel one once, you have to do this for Citrix, um, Cypress one once, ARM one. Uh, pick your favorite chip manufacturer. You have to repeat them. Um, but maybe, and this is maybe, maybe the uh, chip manufacturer say, that's actually useful for us, so we're actually going to certify this for you, give the controller certification. So um, Nordic would do one, Intel would do one, et cetera. And then you can just, as a, as a developer, you just have to combine them. You can just take this, okay, we're running this one, I take this one, I take the host controller one that uh, we have provided as well, and then we combine them and you're pretty much 90% there. There's still paperwork and everything else to do if you want to certify your application and your product, but you have a jump start ahead because everything else is already done. Any other questions? Yes, please. Okay, I'm just trying to quickly summarize this for the tape. So the question was about uh, on the licensing of the Nordic provided stack to Zephyr, the open source one. So the answer is rather simple. It might not be the ones that you like to hear, but the answer is rather simple. So Zephyr is released under Apache 2.0 license, 
and everything that is Zephyr core and Zephyr owned uh, will be Apache 2.0. So now license compatibility, I'm not giving an answer to this one because I'm not getting to myself into trouble. That's up to your legal interpretation of what's combinable or what's not combinable. Um, but Apache 2.0 is a permissive license with a few obligations. And if that works for you, you can happily use it. If you need to do a license for piece of, uh, piece of Zephyr, that's really up to the uh, companies contributing to Zephyr and seeing if they can give a different license. So if you're looking for a BSD type of license or a copy left type of license. So the Nordic guys are here. Feel free to talk to them. Um, they're around um, somewhere. They were probably showing up at the booth or somewhere in the hallway and see what they think about this. But I think the main focus is Apache 2.0 license for Zephyr natively integrated. Sharing outside of Zephyr is currently not in focus. That said, um, if you're fine with ex using something on HCI and just having an HCI interface and two separate cores, uh, license don't really ex uh, generally extend over a use of a generate standardized transport. And HCI is a generalized transport because it actually specified in the Bluetooth spec. I hope that answers your questions. Thank you. There was another one. Uh, okay. So right now there's the minute link layer that the minute uh, project has written, and after that one Nordic uh, open source their. They, they call it Phoenix. So right now it's a Zephyr link layer because the name Phoenix is just for historical reasons. Uh, they open sourced this one and merged it into Zephyr. Is that so probably the source code that they used to give away as the top device? Uh, hard for me to answer. Maybe, maybe not. Um, ask them by yourself. It, it is it's heavily worked on. I can tell you this one right now. And we're trying to actually heavily make a radio abstraction for other chip manufacturers so it will become generally useful for everybody. But the goal is to have one link layer, one scheduler for the link layer, and then the uh, BSP, so to speak, specific part is the radio abstraction. Hope that answers your question. Yes, please. The stack and the open source stack is still featured, and is that, um, or is there a work in progress at the moment? So the BLE host stack is full featured. Uh, they always a work in progress since we're moving towards Bluetooth 5, and there are really a couple of bugs. 4.2 is fully supported. And There's a test suite for it, but we're using the test suite that comes with Bluezy. So it's hooked up uh, into the Bluezy test cases. So you can run the Bluezy test cases against Zephyr. That's why running this in QAMO with a BT proxy is quite useful. So we just pretend to be a device. It doesn't have to be physical. It'll be just a fake device that we have with Bluezy. But it's also integrated into the Bluetooth PTS. PTS stands for Blue Profile Tuning Suite, which they use for the qualification test. So there's an automated setup for PTS against Zephyr. So you can actually maybe start your PTS system and then start Zephyr in QAMO uh, and then just run it against it or even with real hardware. Uh, we're trying to open source the integration with the Bluetooth PTS as well. It just, just hasn't happened yet. I think that will happen. Uh, my prediction is if all went well in the next couple of months, there's a little bit of issues with the Bluetooth SIG and their uh, interface into the PTS and the licensing around this. So we're trying to sort this out. But it looks like the Bluetooth SIG is interested in this one uh, and we are trying to solve this one as well. So the test suite, yes, is available and uh, you can run this by yourself. And you also need this for qualification if you want to run your own qualification. Any other questions? Uh, if not, then thanks everybody and uh, enjoy the rest of the conference.